So welcome in to the official exhibit opening of our Captured in Cartoons exhibit. Um, this is an exhibit that will be here for about a year. And um, you know, as you probably know if you're here, it's really featuring some of the great work of Kevin Sires of the Charlotte Observer. Um, but before we get to that, I would like to just introduce myself and you know what's going on here. So I'm Nolan Dom. Um, I'm our exhibits and programs manager here at the museum. And you know, I've been here for less than a year at this point. And so this exhibit for me is really the first one that I've had the pleasure of kind of being the lead on. And so it's pretty special to me in that sense. Um, you know, I would also like to thank, before we get started, um, the Charlotte Observer, obviously. They're the folks who kind of got this whole thing started. They reached out to us with um, the drawing table that Kevin and his predecessors used. And you know, for us, that was just too good of an opportunity to pass up telling the story behind that. Um, I also want to thank Atkins Library. Um, they're the folks who house the original drawings from Kevin. Um, they are, um, most of them are digitized from 2000 um, toward the present, but a lot of those first um, 13 years or so are just papers that are there as well, and you'll see a lot of those blown up in the exhibit. Um, and then last, a short thank you to Duke, um, Duke Energy as well. You'll see we've got a few objects from them, um, and it'll make sense if, when you go see the exhibit. Um, but basically the exhibit that um, we're going to be chatting about today, um, after we chat, we'll go upstairs and you know, we'll answer questions and hang out up there. But you'll notice that the exhibit is, as we say on these slides here, it's 200 years of Charlotte's cartoons. Um, but it's, you know, it's not a history of Charlotte through cartoons. I think that would be kind of an impossible task. So what we did is we chose some themes to hit on. So basic themes like war and sports, but also, you know, there's a, there's a section that's an ode to the Charlotte News, um, the last cartoon that was printed in the Charlotte News. Um, you'll see some animation and some, um, you know, you'll see Zax from Duke Power. I don't know if any of us are familiar with him. Um, and then you'll see kind of a recreation of Kevin's office that we'll talk about in a second, but, um, and that's featuring the desk. Um, so, you know, anyway, um, I will, I'll let the person speaking after me introduce Kevin, but, you know, as we all know, he's a Pulitzer Prize winner, and I only, you know, we'll talk more about that, but what I think is special about it is the Pulitzer was won in 2014 for cartoons that were drawn in 2013. So, you know, if you have a chance to produce through the Pulitzer winners, we're, we're in the 10th anniversary of all of those cartoons, so it's pretty special. Um, so, you know, I, I do have the pleasure of introducing today, though, some, um, someone gonna, who's going to speak before Kevin. Um, that's Peter St. Orange. He is the McClatchy Opinion Editor and North Carolina Opinion Editor at the Charlotte Observer, the Raleigh News and Observer, and the Durham Herald Sun. Um, so I'll let Peter take it away, and he'll give us a proper introduction to Kevin and tell us a few stories along the way. everybody, I'm glad you're here. Um, one of the treats of being an editorial board colleague of Kevin Tires, and I've been one for about 12 years, um, was watching tour groups come through the Charlotte's over the year, to the corner where the editorial board sat. So I would sit about 10 to 15 feet away, and I would see these groups kind of shuffle tentatively to Kevin's doorway and lean in and peek, and in seriously what were hushed tones say, is, is that Kevin's drawing table? And, and do you think it's okay if I sit in this chair? Um, and it, it was great. It was you know, something between a, an exhibit and a sacred space. And it was an important place in Charlotte. Um, and to these folks, it was the place where the magic happened. And I got that because when I first started working with Kevin, I kind of felt the same way. But in the dozen years that we've worked together, I've learned that it's really not magic at all. Kevin is the best, among the best at what he does for the same reasons that a lot of people are the best. He's gifted, yes, and he's talented, of course, but he's also driven. He constantly is improving and refining what he does. And above all, he's curious, um, and I think that's kind of the foundation of his brilliance. When people ask me about Kevin, I tell them that he's among the most well-read people that I know, that more than anyone else in the editorial board, he sends news stories and opinion pieces, things he's read that day for all of us to read and think about. Um, and he's engaged in, in Charlotte, what's happening here, and he's engaged in North Carolina and nationally. And 
because of that, it's a big part of why his cartoons are so potent and such an important part of the opinion pages. Um, and I want to talk before I go just a moment about the opinion pages and newspapers and cartoonists because there are fewer cartoonists now than there were five years ago and certainly 10 years ago and 20 years ago. Um, but one of the things that we have learned with Kevin's help is that cartoons and cartoonists can consistently have a strong reach to audiences in the digital world, which is where we are heading. Um, and I believe that they'll continue to be an important part of what we do. So as you see this exhibit today, and I've gotten a peek, and it's great, and Kevin's drawing table is there, um, I want you not only to to enjoy the glimpse of Charlotte and, and the newspaper and cartoons and what we once were, but understand that it's what we continue to be. And I want you to join me in appreciating and celebrating one of the finest journalists I know, Kevin Sires. Thank you. I'm Kevin Sires, and uh, I'm addicted to fake news, what can I say? <laughs> um, fake news has a couple, couple different meanings to uh, the folks who believe in such things. When they, when they see something they don't like, when they see an uncomfortable story, when they see something that makes them mad, um, there's a group that wants to dismiss it as fake news. That, that's not, I, I'd want to deal with that. Um, it's an uncomfortable truth. It's something they want to turn away from. It's something they don't want to see. Um, that's, that's the cartoonist's role, is pointing those things out. We're, you know, it's kind of a cliche, but we're the, the little boys, and, and actually some of the best artists these days are women, the little girls, who uh, point out that the emperor has no clothes, and people would prefer not to, to know that. They definitely don't want to see it. But, but that's our job, is to kind of strip away the hypocrisy, point out the falsity, uh, and really, we just like to get our own opinions out there. We just, you know, we think these things, uh, and we want to share them with people. Um, the, other, the, the other thing with fake news is that, as you saw in the little drawing at the beginning with the door on the door of the cartoonist's office, satire is in progress. We're satirists. It's, we don't draw portraits. We draw caricatures. Um, we exaggerate to make a point. Sometimes, you know, the things that are in the cartoons aren't literally true, but we're trying to, to drive a point across. You know, the cartoon is, is a vehicle of opinion, and a very powerful vehicle of opinion, and belongs on, you know, that's why it's on the opinion page, and that's what it does. Hi. Come on in. No, no problem. Um, the exhibit is... is Upstairs is great. I encourage you all to see it. I, I want to thank Nolan for, for all the dedication, the time he put into it. Um, if, if anybody from, the ad, from UNCC is here, they've got all my cartoons uh, from, the, uh, from the last 34, 35 years. Um, and it's, it's, they've just, they've done a great job with this, and I appreciate that so much. Uh, the exhibit upstairs has a facsimile of my cartoonist studio, it's, it's fake news. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is what a cartoonist studio used to look like. Oh, that's, that's the shiny one. Where's the other one? Got it. There's a cartoonist <laughs> studio. <laughs> hey, hello. No, no, and the fire inspector never showed up either, I'll tell you. Uh, this, this, this is an occupational hazard, especially in the days of print journalism. Uh, I just had this, this need to save every piece of paper I could find in case I wanted to draw something from it. Um, this was the old Observer office in the newsroom that was on 600 South Tryon Street, which is no longer there. They have a big bank tower there now. Um, we moved from this to the NASCAR uh, tower. They had our newsroom up there. So this was my office there, which is much more cleaned up. Pretty clean. Uh, the great drawing table. This was fantastic space because I had wall to ceiling, or floor to ceiling 
windows overlooking the government center and I could kind of keep an eye on the people down there. <laughs> and uh, so this is how I did my work for the last, for about 30 years or so, 30, until COVID struck and they had to shut down the newsroom. And one day I just got a call that said, you're gonna to have to start working from home. I was like, well, I don't have any paper, I don't have any ink, <laughs> I don't have my drawing board. What I had was a laptop and so I kind of had to learn a whole new drawing style. And so now everything I do is digital. Uh, so this was drawn on a, uh, a MacBook. And that's, the, that's how it's done these days. Um, but we're here to talk about it, you know, the history of cartoons. And the history of Charlotte. So I'm going to try to do what Nolan said couldn't be done. I'm going to try to, it's, it's not a history of Charlotte. It's a, let's call it a recent history of Charlotte. Um, because the people who use this drawing table um, have been working at, the, you know, my predecessors at the Observer used this drawing table. So there's been at least three Pulitzer Prize winners um, have sat there. It's a piece of history all by itself. I was telling Nolan today that I think if you move that green uh, cover on that thing, there's at least some doodles by Doug Marlette underneath. But, uh, but uh, my predecessors were, were Gene Payne, who uh, started before me, and, um, and Doug Marlette, of course. And, um, and I think another cartoonist from the Charlotte News might have used this table as well. I was talking with him the other day. We were trying to figure out the origins of this table, where it came from, and nobody seems to know or how long it's been there. It came from the back shop somewhere, apparently. But, uh, but Bob Garrell, who used to be the cartoonist for the Charlotte News, they've got one of his cartoons upstairs as well, um, might have used it as well. So it's, it's, it's an artifact. I don't know about it being sacred space. It's certainly sacred to me. <laughs> Uh, the, the other problem with this drawing table is it's so big and so massive that every time I tried to adjust the angle on it, I was, my uh, editor would have to come in to make sure I hadn't been crushed by it. <laughs> I'd always hear something crash in there. And, but I want to talk about uh, my predecessors, too, and show you some of their cartoons. So I'm going to read from a little bit from uh, a book by Jack Claiborne, who's one of the uh, old Observer editorial writers, who's a great historian of Charlotte. And he wrote this history of the Observer and has a few paragraphs about Gene and Doug in it. And uh, he's talking about Gene Payne, who drew in the uh, 50s, 60s. And he, he drew cartoons for us for a long time. He would freelance uh, up to you know, his, his 80s uh, before he finally, finally stopped. Hey, Dean. Um, and he had, he had a kind of a, he was a different style of cartoon. It's kind of old school, if, if you remember back in those, those, well, you'll see his examples. But as Jack writes, Payne was quiet and low key with a sly sense of humor. Um, his style was clean, smooth, and light. He was a fast worker and preferred cartoons that made people laugh. His specialties were jowly politicians with large hats, string ties, big feet, and fat cigars. Rarely did his work make people angry, though he was frequently being betrayed by a casual approach to spelling. <laughs> he spelled words according to, the, to sound and often had to redraw a cartoon at the last minute to correct an error. He once referred to North Carolina Governor Dan Moore as Dan Moore, <laughs> and he mislabeled the British Isles as Great Britain and got a prim complaint from the British ambassador. <laughs> Payne's response to such grievances was usually, to hell with a fellow who can't spell a word but one way. <laughs> a few days before the Pulitzer Awards, word had leaked that the Observer was a finalist in the competition. Um, and as the teletype began to clatter with a story from New York about who the winners were, uh, people in the newsroom gathered around waiting expect expectantly. They shouted joyously as the machine hesitantly spelled out for editorial cartoons, Eugene Gray Payne, the Charlotte Observer. Sitting at his easel, Payne was suddenly hugged and pummeled and clasped by squealing colleagues. The placid cartoonist's reaction wells was, well, what do you know about that? <laughs> um, so Gene, Gene had a more, a more affable approach, as you can tell us. He was also kind of, 
like took the attitude of the everyman, kind of the everyman in Charlotte. Uh, government was a burden to, uh, to be born, but not, you know, to take too seriously. So this is one of Gene's cartoons. And uh, he loved portraying the city council as Laurel and Hardy from the silent film uh, movie. <laughs> and this was kind of, kind of the theme with him. Cartoon when UNCC actually got its uh, four year status and, and did a cartoon of Charlotte calling, putting on pig boy pants. <laughs> it was a celebration. Uh, there was a lot of controversy back in those days because of the, the uh, school integration. Judge McMillan had ordered that the schools had to uh, sign use funding for all means possible. Sorry. <laughs> Sounds the same to me. <laughs> All right. Um, so, but there was opposition between Judge McMillan and the school board. The school board didn't necessarily want to integrate as fast or as uh, completely as Judge McMillan uh, wanted them to. So this is the school board throwing the, ba the ball back in his court, um, as the caption says. Uh, the observer took the took the stand agreeing with Judge McMillan and pushing for integration of the schools, uh, which caused well, a, lot of, a lot of anger at the observer. Uh, so Gene did this cartoon of the poor paper boy having to carry all this anger and frustration around. We were, we were hot stuff back in those days. Yeah. This is a cartoon Gene did about scattered site housing when they'd want to put uh, low-income housing or housing projects in, in quote-unquote nicer neighborhoods. He compared it to putting garbage on nice people's lawns. Um, as I said, he was a little more conservative. Yeah. <laughs> but this is sort of a, an endless theme. The, the caption on this, we're looking at this little wind-up bus. He's, the guy says, you wind it up and it breaks down. It teaches children to cope with urban life. Uh, things haven't changed that much in Charlotte. And then, uh, again, back to, back to crime. Charlotte was apparently a wide open town back in those days, with prostitution and drugs. Doug Marlette came after, came after Gene, um, and he had a different style. As Jack Claiborne writes, his style was dramatically different from what observer readers were used to. Gene Payne liked to sneak up on subjects, Marlette went right for the juggler. Payne's cartoons were light and appealed to the funny bone. Marlette's were heavy and sturdy motions. A Payne cartoon could be laughed at and forgotten. Marlette's cartoons usually got under readers' skins. Over the next few years, Marlette's, he started, his first cartoon was in 1972. Over the next few years, Marlette's cartoons provoked constant controversy. His hard-hitting style forced people to examine their prejudices and their guilt. Perhaps his most controversial cartoon one the observer at first refused to publish was an anti-capital punishment drawing done. It showed Jesus carrying an electric chair up the hill at Calvary. When the cartoon was published, many people resented it. They did not like seeing modern capital punishment equated with crucifixion. Um, it wasn't just uh, wasn't just the public. I mean, he had trouble with the publishers too, <laughs> with cartoons like that. Um, when I, when I started at the Observer, as Nolan had mentioned, there were a lot of editorial cartoonists. There were probably 200 working for newspapers at the time. Uh, nowadays, the, the counts vary. Some of my colleagues say there's only 12 of us. Some of us put it as high as maybe two dozen at the most. Um, newspapers have just, well, they get uncomfortable with that. They, uh, they t it tend to be one of the first positions that get eliminated. I, when I was looking for work, uh, when I was working for the, the student of the University of Minnesota newspaper, I sent a lot of applications to different newspapers for jobs. And all of those positions I applied for, none of them exist anymore. I am so lucky and grateful to get this job at the Observer. And, and part of the reason that 
I feel like I'm still working is because the observer has this strong tradition of cartoonists with Gene and Doug uh, before me and they, they've, there's, they've understood what a great institution it was and I've had great editors uh, that understood how important cartooning is and um, one of them over here, my longtime editor, Ed Williams, who just owe a lot to. <laughs> but um, he, I mean, he would, they, he and Taylor Batten and Peter St. Ange know how to, how to handle uh, the prickly guys the work, who draw these pictures. If they also know how to handle the publishers and the public and, and explain to them just what, what it is we're up to. Um, Char uh, the thing that really uh, worked for Doug and kind of put him on the map was that Charlotte had going for it that nobody else had was the PTL Club. Uh, <laughs> Jim and Tammy Baker. And um, his cartoons just savaged them. <laughs> and ultimately, I think that's, that's what he won his Pulitzer Prize on in um, 86 or 87. I can't remember when it was. But, uh, so this is the first, car he, first cartoon he did of Jim Baker. And this was from 1973, I think. And it's Jim Baker at the Last Supper. I don't know quite how to break this to you, but I'm afraid you're gonna have to let some of you go. And, and Marlette has said that uh, he was told that when Baker saw this cartoon, he started crying. And Marlette thought, well, that's no big deal. Jim Baker will cry over burnt toast. <laughs> this is the, the famous water slide at the PTL at Heritage USA, uh, kind of crashing the baptism. And this is a very strong statement on how he felt about televangelism. People kind of, they wanted to call him a tool of Satan. I got, I've been called that the same way for a car, couple cartoons I did. And, you know, we take issue with that. We, we kind of feel like we're working for the other side, you know. And, uh, PTL scandal drove out Jim and Jerry Falwell took over. He says, that's right, Jim and Tammy were expelled from paradise and left me in charge. Um, legend has it, and Marlette had a, lot to do with spreading, had a lot to do with spreading this legend, is that uh, this cartoon is actually one reason he left The Observer, because um, the news editors were very upset by it, because Falwell had been feeding them a lot of dirt on Jim Baker, and then this upset Falwell and dried up that source, but... I'm not sure that's true, but I've, I've heard the story. But anyway, it, it's great stuff. Um, I came in shortly after Doug left. Uh, I think I started in late 1987. Um, and I was very excited to come to Charlotte. It was a progressive southern city. Uh, Harvey Gant was the mayor. I no sooner got hired by the Observer than Harvey Gant lost the election, and Sue Myrick was the new mayor. She had a different approach to politics, very moralistic. She once suggested that everybody in Charlotte needs to take a drug test. So this was my cartoon to that, her in a specimen cup. Come on in, water's fine. <laughs> this is one of my cartoons about evangelism. Uh, this couple's going by saying, Billy Graham's coming to Erickson Stadium. Finally, people will get a chance to meet Jesus. Meanwhile, if they had read Matthew 25, they would know that if you see the least and the last and the lost, you have met Jesus, and these people walk by unseen, that person. Now, this, this cartoon, as Ed would attest, caused a huge controversy. <laughs> uh, so it goes. <laughs> this was on uh, school equity issues, school funding issues. Uh, the, the integration of Charlotte schools had ended, they'd gone back to neighborhood schools and school choice, and then, you know, how are you gonna divide up the cash? Uh, there was this constant tug of war between the inner city schools, the suburban schools, who's going to be funded? So the inner city schools uh, obviously were underfunded. Meanwhile, the suburban schools had their own problems. Um, little kid is saying in this picture, the school, the school choice plan is a success, it got us away from those high poverty kids who could have hurt our academic. Uh, 
Uh, transit was a huge, uh, huge controversy. We, we got the light rail going. They wanted to expand it. Uh, a group wanted to repeal the transit tax, and which basically would have killed light rail. Um, Phil Dubois, who was the chancellor of UNCC, uh, disagreed with those arguments. He thought that you know, light rail was was really the way to go. He didn't have much faith in uh, the anti arguments for that. Uh, he dismissed their uh, their arguments as yada yada yada. So I drew the other side as saying yabba dabba do. <laughs> and this was kind of a theme I kept up. Well, so there there was a repeal motion to to end the tax, and this was one issue that I just kind of kept hammering on time and time again over the course of those months, uh, which is, I think, a very effective thing for cartoonists to do. We, you know, you get on something. If you have something you care about, you go after it. You, uh, and this was. And so the, they had the election, and the transit tax won. So using the caveman motif again to uh, and the evolution theme. And you know, I think I think the light rail's been great, but you know, cats just they couldn't wait to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. <laughs> and the, the cost you just got to control the funding uh, again was a problem. I did a cartoon of uh, Mayor Pratt, Pat McCrory on the street corner uh, with his hand out singing. Uh, once I built a railroad, made it run, made it race against time. Once I built a railroad, now it's done. Brother, can you spare me a dime? <laughs> and that just kind of goes, you know, to today. <laughs> and it's just a real big mess. Uh, sports in Charlotte is always was a big thing. This was a cartoon I did uh, when Dale Earnhardt died in his tragic accident. My wife actually gave me the idea for this cartoon. <laughs> I got the phone call. It was like, like 10 o'clock, 9 o'clock at night or something. and It was late, and I had to go in and draw something. And she, Why don't you draw the number three turning into a bird? Yeah, that, that works. That's great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. No, she did not. <laughs> After all these years, it could be revealed. This is my Cam Newton tribute. He was having trouble that year, but still liked to uh, pull the shirt open. It, this, landed, uh, this landed on the desk of a sports commentator for ESPN, and uh, again, stirred huge controversy about it, but I thought it was cute. I thought it was funny. Mm -hmm. It was just kind of lighthearted. <laughs> uh, the arena funding, a lot of resources went to build that thing, but uh, there were other needs neglected. And the little child says, what's a skybox? Uh, Patrick Cannon <laughs> had a bit of trouble, really didn't do much for the city. Uh, the next mayor that came in, though, had, well, he was just fun to draw. Dan Claudefelter had this great mustache. And got to use it a number of ways. Um, the other co controversy back in those days was the, the legislature wanted to take over the, the airport. And uh, they worked very hard toward that end. So this is just, you know, changing hands. Uh, one of the local Mecklenburg legislators was very involved in trying to, to, to wrest control from the city to the state. <laughs> so I hate airport negotiations with Ruth Samuelson. Our, the publisher at the time heard a lot about this cartoon from Ruth Samuelson. <laughs> I was glad she took the phone call and not me. The art uh, sales tax they wanted to pass, but without saying how they were going to use the money. They said, Guys, we need more information. That was a fun campaign. Uh, this is, you know, 
Trisha Cawthon made big news the other day with switching parties. She's not the only one to run into that problem. Her mother, Pat Cawthon, was the uh, chair of the county commissions. You know, she's always been the highest vote getter. Uh, the highest vote getter gets to be the chair, but the other Democrats had problems with her, uh, the fact that she would actually talk to the Republicans. So how can they call me exclusive? Haven't I brought all the Democrats together? Uh, the Republicans in Charlotte are not doing well. This is uh, using the, the symbol of the elephant as a symbol of the Republican Party. They're, they're becoming an extinct species. HB2, I'll, I'll remember that one. Um, Charlotte passed a non-discrimination ordinance and the legislators just flipped out about it and that was my response to them. But Charlotte landed on the map. Um, we have presidential uh, nominating conventions here now. So this was my take on that, using the Firebird statue. And there's still that crime problem floating around. Uh, the homicide rate's still very high, so I really haven't gotten that much further away than uh, Gene Payne in a lot of ways. But uh, a lot of the cartoons that I have are uh, from, the, from the late 80s and 90s, are, are as Nolan, Nolan said, is boxed up over at UNCC. Someday they're going to get them out and archive them. But, so I kind of missed that decade in this because when we closed up the newsroom, I had to like ship them all off over to UNCC, and well, COVID struck, and you couldn't get back at them. But uh, anyway, that's that's sort of my brief tour. Um, thank you guys all, and check out the exhibit there. It's it's quite fun, and go ahead and sit in the chair if you want. I don't know. <laughs> all right, thank you. got questions or anything it's probably a good time too but if you just want to go upstairs you've sat here long enough are you, are you, are you retired right now? I am not retired I'm still working away yeah the the, uh, the handcuff cartoon at the beginning and the dumpster fire cartoon I just did a couple of weeks ago well, thank you very much well, th you're welcome yes sir It's very much that, um, right, the, the, li the current libel law now, is if, if it's a public figure, they have to put up with a certain amount of actual malice. And of course, car cartoons are dripping with actual malice. But, but there was also a famous case involving uh, well, and uh, Larry Flint, where Larry Flint had done this cartoon of Falwell, doing all kinds of sacrilegious things. It was based on a Campari ad. Uh, you never forget your first time, I'll let your imagination run away with how that was. But the Supreme Court ruled that, look, this is a cartoon. People know this is a cartoon. Come on, give us a break. And so they, they gave the cartoon, the cartoonists even more freedom to go after and do satire. And what's most interesting is that instead of wanting to sue Kevin, they will call him and ask for a drawing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I do get a lot of that. I, I want to draw, you know, I, I, you want to go after this guy, you want to make this, you know, I just want him to cringe, I want him to go under the couch like Jim Baker in the fetal position, and then he'll call up and say, oh, that was great, can I have a copy of that? <laughs> Jesse Helms uh, would collect cartoons, you know, the meanest cartoons that Doug Marlett or I could think to do. Jesse Helms would have his the entire wall of his office with those cartoons. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes. <laughs> um, no, nah, I don't care to mention it. <laughs> one, thing, one thing they've got up there is um, an exhibit where you can go through and look to see the, the cartoons that I've done and the, the ones that are digitally on file. And I feel bad about that because there are cartoons in there that I should have burned. <laughs> I'm just sorry. Um, I've changed my mind or that was not the best way to draw that. But it's daily journalism. You learn, you grow. What can you say? Yes, sir. Do you have any favorite comics or cartoon television shows? 
No, I, don't, I haven't watched cartoons. When my son was growing up, I'd watch The Simpsons all the time. Uh, but uh, I love Pearls Before Swine. Uh, there's a guy, he's kind of local, and I don't think his cartoon gets a lot of distribution, but uh, Brewster Rocket, I think, is hilarious. Yeah. Yeah, for years, I mean, the Observer didn't have the capabilities of printing color cartoons, especially in the editorial page. Um, and I, I learned that, you know, when, when we started going digital, and this was maybe like 2012, 2011, uh, I would, probably a little earlier than that, but I would scan the cartoon in, and one version would be for the print paper, and then another version would be for the website. And I could colorize that, so I would do that in a, in a, in a, in a low resolution um, using Photoshop. And then the Observer got a new set of printing presses, I think is what had happened, and they could start printing things in color. So then um, I did a version of the cartoon that, it, like a high resolution that, that could be in color, and then so that just became a standard thing. Like, in the old days, I would color it or not, you know, depending on, because some cartoons, I think, just work better in black and white. But, but nowadays, um, when I said I do the cartoons digitally now, uh, there's very little pen and ink involved. I still do a lot of doodling in pencil. But if, if I like what I've drawn, I'll scan that in and finish the drawing. I use two software programs. I use uh, this thing called uh, Sketchbook, which you can work with fine, you, you get like a nice black line it's like for that substitutes for my inks. And then I still use Photoshop to, uh, to colorize the cartoons. And, and you can actually paint with that. And it's very, it's very fun. And some, some of the cartoons are, you know, the, the color carries it. The, there was a t-shirt uh, several years back when, when Tammy Faye was uh, famous, where I ran into Tammy Faye at the mall, and, and they had the imprint of her face uh, in color on the t-shirt. Well, when she died, I did an, a cartoon of an angel wearing that t-shirt says, I ran into Tammy Faye in heaven and was able to do the painting of it. And, and that, that was fun to do. Okay, oh, yes, sir. How much of the work of the actual drawing, how much of it is trying to figure out what to draw? And most of it's trying to figure out what to draw. That, that, is, that is the hard challenge, especially because um, well, some of these issues just don't go away. I mean, the, 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 the latest mass shooting incident, I mean, like, okay, how many times have I tried to address this and how can I say something new about it? And, and, and then sometimes the drawing's very complicated. Uh, there's a character, you know, if I can't get a caricature right, um, the, the Trish Cotham cartoon took a long time. I was not satisfied, I'm still not satisfied with the final caricature. Uh, other cartoons just seem to fall into place. It's just kind of, you know, Luck. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, I, work, I was uh, head of the editor for many years. Uh, and I was Doug Harlett's editor before that. And uh, when Doug left, uh, the Observer, as Kevin said, had a commitment to, to coming up with a worthy successor. So we opened it to a nation, nationwide talent search. At that time, this is pre-social media, uh, the only way a cartoonist could hope to make a living was drawing for a newspaper. So uh, you, you might imagine how many would-be cartoonists there are out there who saw this as the opportunity of a lifetime, literally, and uh, sent in their work. And it was really depressing <laughs> uh, because while a lot of them were very good at character, very good at, at drawing, very good at the artistic performance. The difference between a good cartoon and a great cartoon is that the great ones pop. And, uh, and I just didn't find any that, uh, that popped. And I was very depressed. And then one day I got this little package uh, from a 
student at the University of Minnesota, Kevin, and I thought, the clouds have parted, because <laughs> they thought. And uh, I, I told Rich Offel, who was the editor at the time, and Ralph Dale, who was the publisher, we, this is it, we've got it. So Rich and I, Kevin had won a uh, national award uh, for best college cartoonist at the time, we were going to a convention in Washington, Rich and I went up and talked to him, and he seemed too meek <laughs> to have done those cartoons. Little did we know what lurked within. <laughs> but readers have been finding out ever since. It was one of the greatest hires uh, the Observer ever made. So, well. Oh, well, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, that's it. I'm done now. I, I can't top that. <laughs> thank you, you guys. And, Enjoy the exhibit upstairs. <laughs>